Hello, and welcome to Risk Master Cheat Codes, the 26th episode in our Crossing Thin Ice podcast series, brought to you by Actuarial Risk Management. My name is Max Rudolph, and as always, I'm joined by Dave Ingram. Documentation is a lost art for many. I'm sure there are others like me. As hard as I try, I could do better. Today, Dave will walk us through his process, leveraging components from regulatory and rating agency documents that help someone new quickly acclimate themselves. We hope the Crossing Thin Ice podcast series is helping you with your ERM program and risk knowledge. These offerings sometimes look at specific risks, but also consider practical aspects of risk management. By the way, nothing in today's podcast is intended to be investment advice. We are here to provide educational material on ERM topics without getting lost in the weeds. We hope that you will also take advantage of our complimentary quarterly newsletter and webcast on a variety of risk management topics. Let's get started and learn about cheat codes. I imagine that in the doomsday bunker hidden somewhere in the mountains, there's a book, more likely an entire wall of books, that contain the instructions to restart civilization. At the other extreme, my impression is that many insurers do not even have a brief Cliff's Notes version of, of that for their ERM program. I've seen it over and over that when the executive or board member who is the champion of the last ERM program retires or leaves, the ERM program often just withers away and there is little help available for someone who wants to keep it going or restart it. The Risk Management Framework is the official name of the document that provides a brief summary of the key decisions that have been made about how ERM is to be practiced at a company. It has enough information that when the ERM champion leaves, their successor should be able to understand from that document what is the expected flow of back and forth that makes up the ERM program and who are the main players in that activity. It's not a detailed manual of documenting every step. That level of knowledge should easily survive the passing of one executive. I like to think of this as the risk master cheat codes. With a good risk management framework document, a new executive or board member should be able to step right in and work to maintain or revive an ERM program. When you're writing or updating your ERM framework document, imagine that you are writing it to provide a high-level guide to that next generation of management and or board members to guide them in continuing the life of the ERM program. Like the idea of writing a letter to your 21-year-old self. Here's the suggestion of what to include related to five components of an ERM framework that appear in both the NEIC ORSA guidance manual and the AM BEST rating criteria document. First, risk identification and prioritization. This tells whether and how you identify your risks or if you are using a standard list. A good process strikes a balance between a totally homemade list that potentially misses one or more of the risks that are important to most insurers and a totally standard list that misses your unique situation. The second item would be risk management and controls. One way to think of a complete risk management system is calling it N plus one control cycles, one for each of the N key risks and one for controlling the aggregate risk. These control cycles will each have its own unique characteristics to reflect the differences among the risks and the variety of, of opinions for managing each risk. The third item should be risk appetite, tolerance, and limits. Risk limits are, are the pain points for each of the N risks. Tolerance is that point for the aggregate risk. And appetite is the overall risk strategy or approach. The fourth item would be risk culture. This tells the story of how staff are organized to accomplish the above items. In general, the culture of business is the approach to accomplishing the objectives that have been learned by the staff and passed along to new staff as they are brought on board. Risk culture can then be thought of as the approach to risk management. Creating a risk culture in a company that doesn't have one requires significant time and attention from top management. The fifth and final element would be risk government. That refers to the oversight by top management and the board of the risk management system. This usually includes a risk oversight committee of the board and in a larger insurer, a management risk committee as well. 
There are two additional topics that might be next on the list for inclusion in the ERM framework. Those are, first, risk reporting. This is needed at two levels, at a detailed level to support the ongoing risk management efforts and as a summary level to convey the total quantum of each risk that are accepted by the insurer as well as the amount of risk that remains after risk management efforts. This report is shown to top management and the board oversight committee several times each year. And the second item would be stress testing. That's a practice that we have mentioned over and over again because we believe it is the absolutely most cost-effective way for an insurer to gain insights into its risks and the effectiveness of its risk management system. One key thing to keep in mind is that this is being written for a reader who has never seen the program in operation. That will make these risk master cheat codes the most effective, and that should also break the cycle of death and rebirth for the risk management program. Are you challenged to meet your need for actuaries? Actual risk management can help. ARMS Data and Modeling Institute, or DMI, is a team of talented and experienced modeling actuaries working with an extensive bench of senior consultants. ARM will partner with you to shift all or part of your actuarial and modeling needs to the DMI at a significant cost savings without sacrificing integrity. Contact ARM today about how the DMI's modeling evaluation services can help position you and your company for tomorrow's challenges. What are, what are these cheat codes, Dave, and, and what does that have to do with the uh, risk management framework? Oh, Max, you're showing your age. Cheat codes go with video games uh, or computer games. I'm probably showing my age by not knowing the right title for them. Cheat codes I learned about from my kids who, when they were playing video games, they became quite expert at finding out where to get the cheat codes for the game. And what the cheat codes allowed them to do was to jump ahead in the game or to get some kind of superpower for, for their character in the game. Uh, so that they could play as if they were a master player. And, and so that was, that was the thought that I, that I came to when I was thinking about the risk management framework statement is that uh, it can operate just like these cheat codes, that if you have a good risk management framework statement, then that can help people who aren't spending all their time on risk management to be able to master the risk management game. Definitely, it's it's showing my age. When I was in college, I couldn't afford to play those games, and and now I'm just not interested. So, <laughs> Dave, this this topic also reminds me of one of the the great risk stories of all time, uh, that also provided a, a jump start to uh, scenario planning practices. Can can you discuss how Shell Oil and their their actions in the 1960s proved useful during during the oil embargo and for their company in particular? Sure, and and uh, it was actually in the it started in 1970, and it was uh, the company was called Royal Dutch Shell at that time. What they're famous for doing was in 1970 they started doing scenario planning when they they hired a new planning officer. With that scenario planning, what they did was imagine uh, some future situations or scenarios. And, and then uh, had a discussion of what the company's strategy should be if that scenario happened. Uh, and uh, with those discussions, Shell was able to, uh, when the oil crisis in, in uh, I guess it was 1973 happened, the first oil crisis, Shell had discussed that scenario in one of their previous exercises. And so they had, they didn't, anticipate the exact scenario that happened, but they anticipated something similar. So when they were faced with the reality of it, they already were two steps down the road of, of working out what to do. They were able to execute much better than, than other oil companies in that first crisis. And that allowed them to grow from being a, a middle tier oil company to a, a top global firm. So they were very successful with that. They've also been very public with that uh, scenario planning process. And, and through the years on their website, they've posted a lot of different uh, documents explaining how to do the scenario planning process. I've read quite a number of them and, and they're very helpful. 
An another example of uh, a company that uh, has used this process is uh, another European-based company, Airbus. Uh, they use scenario planning, and uh, they say it, it, it's helped them with things like anticipating technology changes, regulatory changes, and, and, and market and customer changes. Uh, and, and they say that it's also helped them with supply chain disruption. So it's worked so well for them that they use it as a, a very a major part of their strategic planning process. It's interesting. I mean, there's there's a lot, a, a number of stories like that out there, but I think there's not nearly enough. I think a, a lot of companies, they do it as a checklist exercise. Dave, your, your cheat codes are, are a great way to consider consistent risk management practices across generations of management teams. Why is risk culture so difficult to, to create and, and even more so maintain? Well, yeah, first, let me just mention something about that first point about uh, using it across generations. One of the things I've seen happen over and over again is that one management team puts in a risk management process and and then they call me back uh, and I, I help people do that. They call me back five years later and they want to do a new risk management process again because they've forgotten what the first one was. Whoever was the champion of it has retired or moved on and everybody else just let it fall through their fingers and it's gone. If you have a risk management framework document, that allows you to, to keep going with the risk management process, I think, in a good way. But to your, to your main question, Max, about risk culture, well, first you have to think about, well, what is culture? And, and my favorite author on this is a fellow who's now an emeritus, MIT management professor, Edgar Schein. He had some experiences in the late 1990s uh, with a lot of those uh, internet startup firms. Some of them heard about corporate culture and hired him as a consultant to come help them with their culture formation. And he wrote about his experiences with that and, and was, so was there uh, and, and you know had a, a bird's eye view of what was going on in a new company when a culture was forming. What he described was fairly simple to describe, at least, maybe not simple to do, but what he said that uh, what formed the culture was the company did things that they planned to do, and some of those things were successful, and the companies that persisted and grew were the ones that kept making the right choices, and, and what they did was they reinforced those good actions that, that created the success. And so the, the, the culture became uh, the belief among all the employees that if we do these particular things in the way that we do them, we will be successful. And that was kind of how he defined a culture, is, the, is that shared belief on what it is we do to be successful. Uh, so you, you think about that, and, and, and so you have a feedback mechanism. You, you do something and you get success. You do something, you get success. Well, think about that in terms of a risk management program, though. The feedback from a good performing risk management system is that the company doesn't have outside losses. Uh, that's a little tricky, though, from this culture formation point of view. Uh, the absence of outside losses is not the sort of feedback that usually works with people. People don't keep track of what doesn't happen that well. And so management has to be extremely deliberate in, in pointing out those uh, risk management successes. Uh, and, and they also have to avoid the thing that I've seen happen in many companies, which is, uh, and maybe this is a, a particularly American thing, but uh, all too often I've seen lots of, lots of praise being heaped on someone who ignores the risk management constraints and does something that results in a big sale or even a big profit. And, and that person is seen to be somebody who took a risk and, and succeeded. Uh, and, and, and if we do that, we totally undermine the idea of a, of a risk management culture. Yeah, it's, it's all about the process. You know, the results are, are nice, but did you, did you follow the process that you set up up front? Dave, you and I both are, are really proud of, of trying to be practical in our risk views and, and not be too theoretical. Board members on, on risk committees, you know, sometimes feel that, that going to the risk committee is a waste of their time. Why do you think that is? 
Well, Max, I had the experience in the last two years of being a board member on a risk committee. <laughs> so uh, I, I can talk about this a little bit from my own experience, but also projecting to, to what I think is going on in, in other board meetings. Uh, one thing I think is that too often there's too much discussion in the risk committee at a detailed level. Sometimes risk management comes from a school of risk management that tells them that the more risks that you have on your risk register, the better risk manager, manager you are. You, you're really proud of this gigantic risk register, 100, 120, 130 risks you have on your risk register, and, and you bring that to show it to the board. I think that the, the discussions that work out the best at the board level is when management has limited themselves to just the top five or six of those risks, even if they have a list of 100, which I don't think is a great idea anyway. However long the list is, you probably should be able to uh, identify just a half dozen of them that, that are the ones that should be going to the board. So that's that's one reason that the board may think it's a waste of time. But I think a second reason relates more to this risk management framework idea that we've, we've been talking about. If you have a good risk management framework, that provides the board members who are supposed to be looking at things from the 10,000 foot level, it provides them a template to look, look for, to say, here's what the risk management program should look like. And if you don't provide that template and you just provide little views of this risk, the view of this risk, a view of that risk, it gets really frustrating to figure out, well, okay, what should I be seeing here? What, what's a good discussion here? because it's all totally episodic. It's, there's no pattern to it. I, I think a part of that framework would be the idea that you're going to present to the board a plan for the risk management of each of those five or six risks that you've identified. And then you want to regularly point to that plan and tell the board whether you're sticking to the plan and also whether the plan is working. These plans should be consistent with the risk management framework. And when the plans are presented, that link between the plans and the risk management framework should be emphasized. Frankly, the, this advice about risk management makes risk management be treated just the same way you're treating every other major corporate issue. You don't bring 20, 30 details on some corporate topic to the board. You, you, you refine it down to the two or three or five most important aspects of, of a topic, and that's what you bring to the board. You, you do this whole control cycle idea of making a plan and comparing your activity to the plan and comparing and, and also discussing the effectiveness of the plan. And that's what will keep the board interested, I think. Well, Max, um, let me ask you, what, what do you think? Can you tell us something important that should be included in the risk management framework that I've not mentioned so far? Well, first, I'll say amen to everything that you just said putting things out for the board that makes their time be used efficiently and, and usefully is, is really important. But another, uh, one topic that we haven't hit on before, but for, for this topic, but we have for other topics is, is stress testing. You know, it's an incredibly important component of a risk framework. You, you need to align the actual practices with, with the chosen risk appetite and stress testing allows both the modeler and the risk manager to understand that marginal impact of decisions and alert decision makers where there's a need to hedge certain risks or to put your foot on the throttle and exploit opportunities. It, it really aligns really well with, with your response there, Dave, to, to really go into the board and, and talk to them about what really matters. Dave, do you have anything else you wanna, you wanna share here on stress testing? Max, I'm sure you remember, I don't know if everybody in our audience was aware of this, but Last, a, a year ago, we did a risk management practices study, and I think we had 50, 60 companies participate in that. And, and stress testing was the one part of what we call the risk management framework in, in that study that got the lowest score. It was fully implemented by the fewest number of companies compared to the other six or seven or eight uh, elements of the, of the risk management framework. We had it on that list, though, because AM Best has it there also as one of their most important elements of a risk management framework. And at one point in time, I, about 10, 12 years ago, AM Best was asking every insurer to give them results of six or seven stress tests. We, we helped about 30 insurers fulfill that request. 
And uh, yeah, you do something 30 times and it gets easier. But we found in general that doing the stress test was relatively easy to perform. It took a tiny fraction of the amount of time it took to do, for instance, a development of a, of a stochastic model or something. As you keep saying, Max, stress tests are very useful. I'm here saying that they're fairly easy to do. And AM Best is saying they're important to their rating view of, of an insurer's ERM. So what else do you want? Let us know if you want to talk more about this. As a risk team builds out their ERM program, it is just as important to help future risk teams understand the process as it is to develop individual components. Personnel transfers, new bosses, and general transitions following promotions can be unbearable for the next team or set up something they can build off of and add even more value. The next generation will thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Crossing Thin Ice presented by Actuarial Risk Management. If you find it valuable, please like, subscribe, and share with your colleagues.